This is Dr. Lorenzo Norris, Editor-in-Chief of MD Edge Psychiatry. And today we're pleased to have Dr. Scott Norton and Dr. John Koo join us today on a discussion, which I think that you're going to find it's very interesting. The topic is delusional parasitosis. Now, this may be a topic that many have maybe heard or somewhat familiar with, but you haven't had the chance to actually hear about it from the perspective of a primary care dermatologist and a um, a psychiatrist who was boarded in dermatology. So we really have a, a we have a great team to, here today to talk about delusional parasitosis. And I must say that I'm very pleased that uh, Dr. Norton uh, is GW affiliated as my, as am myself. So I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So please stay with us and stay uh, as we talk about delusional parasitosis. Dr. Norton. Um, it truly is a pleasure to have you here on the Sitecast. And when I first was approached about this topic, about hearing about delusional parasitosis, I got to tell you, I was like, wow, I need to learn some more. I really need to understand this topic a little bit better. As many uh, uh, ministers of the Sitecast may or may not know, I am trained as a consult liaison psychiatrist. So consequently, one of the categories that we frequently think about, obviously, are psychosomatic medicine conditions. Um, so when I heard this topic, I was like, this is going to be very interesting to hear about delusional uh, parasitosis, particularly from a frontline primary care dermatologist who in many ways is going to be the first person to actually really work up our patients and determine whether or not we're dealing with delusional parasitosis or something else. So Dr. Norton, again, welcome to the Sitecast. Because you walk us through a little bit of really what your approach is to working with and recognizing delusional parasitosis when you suspect this in your differential diagnosis for a patient. Sure. Um, one point I'd like to make, Lorenzo, uh, at this point is um, that although we've been using the term delusions of parasitosis, we must recognize that there's a handful of names used to describe this condition. So uh, very often it's called delusions of infestation mm -hmm. uh, because oftentimes we'll think of parasitosis as being internal, but this can be internal or external. Um, there's another condition that's called Morgellons or Morgellons disease, and that is also in this sphere. Um, and... Um, there's a number of other terms that have been used here. So uh, Dr. Ku and I may wind up using uh, the terms variously. And although there's not a precise definition, um, it's, again, one of those things, you know it when you see it. So uh, we understand what we're talking about uh, when we use these terms. But, they're, um, you, but uh, others may have encountered uh, the term delusions of parasitosis in one of its other iterations, other forms. But... Um, you mentioned that I'm the, the frontline dermatologist. That is true. But oftentimes, there's other primary care uh, providers who are seeing the patients long before I do. If a patient has a sensation that there's some infestation, usually it's a crawling sensation, they'll often present to their own primary care uh, physician. Sometimes uh, it'll be so distressing that they'll present to an emergency room. And uh, we find that those individuals um, are often the true frontline folks. Um, very often, I think it's it's just so difficult in a busy emergency room, a busy primary care clinic, to do the thorough evaluation that you believe this patient uh, requires to get to the heart of this. And um, so there's a bit of a frustration involved in that initial visit. I think what happens then is that the primary care doc or the emergency room physician will then uh, seek a consultant. And typically the consultants that uh, we look to are either infectious disease folks or dermatologists. And um, I'll speak from the dermatology standpoint uh, and and that the dermatologist may in fact be the ideal person to uh, ideal specialist to send the patient to uh, first because um, part of the definition of this delusion to parasitosis is that there's abnormal sensations in the skin and even though there may not be true organisms in the skin the patients very often come up with little bits of detritus lint debris, um, threads from clothing, dust, skin scales, and look at that as evidence of some minute organism that is uh, invading 
eating uh, their skin. And patients will very often have containers. At one time it was called the matchbox sign, but now it probably the Ziploc bag sign would be a better term where the patients collect some of these objects. That in itself is not a, uh, an abnormal uh, response. In fact, I'm very pleased if a person comes in who had been out uh, in the forest and was bitten by ticks. I'm delighted to have that individual come in with a specimen or two to help me uh, determine what the tick was, what species the tick was, and what diseases, if any, uh, the patient may be at risk for. But when these patients show up on my doorstep after seeing their primary care doc, very often they'll have a bundle of uh, Ziploc bags with bits of uh, material in them, specimens in them. And um, it's not just having that, which I said is, is useful, but it often is accompanied by a log book, also a, a daily journal with entries of, uh, with great detail of where the patient was when this particular speck was found and how that speck was removed and what the speck felt like. and. Um, when uh, I, I almost expect hand in hand with the bags to have this uh, log book uh, heavily documenting the sensations. When the patient comes to me, I really feel like my first obligation is to do a thorough um, examination, the history and physical, albeit directed towards these sensations to determine if uh, they're indeed uh, are some infesting organisms because as we know we have scabies mm -hmm. head lice and nowadays uh, a lot of body lice as well so it's incumbent on us to do the evaluation for those true infestations you know dr norton i i'm glad you brought up uh, our colleagues definitely all of our colleagues in primary care primary care of uh, uh, in medicine doctors as well as the ed in a big you know acknowledgement to our doctors our our uh ED docs or psych psychiatric ED folks, because you, you actually gave me a flashback to either when I'm in the ED at times now, I'm not as much, but definitely as a resident and patients would come with complaints either of infestation, uh, scratching or itching or anything of that nature. And you, as psychiatrists, we become very concerned because pruritus, or if you will, that that's a very distressing state, you know, or even the sensation of infestation. And you mentioned a very important, to, you know, because there's scabies, there's head lice, there's body lice. And I liked the visual of, because again, you, you brought me back. I haven't encountered it in a while, but the, what, what did you say? Did you said the Ziploc bag sign as well as the journal, which I think we could, we, we definitely at times see. So all of those, all of those in terms of how we think about patients that regardless of what the what delusional parasitosis or delusions of infestation, these are things that, that are in our differential. But with those common, those things, the scabies, the head lice and body lice, can you educate us a little bit in terms of maybe what your process is and maybe ways in which you can quickly, I won't say quickly, but start to make a differential or go down your differential very quickly for the lay folks of us who aren't uh, dermatologists, what are the different things that you look for in addition to the Ziploc sign or um, if you will, the uh, detailed journal sign? Yeah, Dr. Norris, thank you for uh, making those comments because uh, you're right, the, the people come in with unwanted sensations on the skin. It's usually itch. Itch and pruritus are synonymous terms but they are very distressing. Just think about when you try to go to sleep and you have some pruritus, that is a real challenge. If you have some pain, you might be able to take some Motrin, it might go away on its own in certain postures, but itch doesn't resolve quite like that. So uh, this can be very uh, devastating uh, and, uh, and a real encumbrance on a person's life. Um, but one of the things that I do in my evaluation as I'm doing my physical exam is the, the language that the patient uses. Mm -hmm. um, very often if, if a patient is itchy, they'll wonder, well, I wonder if it might be this. I visited my cousin who had little kids and may have had scabies, but they could also say, but you know, I'm on a new medication. Mm -hmm. um, I recently changed my soap. Um, I've started a new diet and uh, they'll, and they'll say, uh, perhaps I've got uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Could any of these things be the cause? So um, most patients, when they come in with itch, uh, really they are uh, open to, to uh, the thorough history and physical, and they want you to come to the root of it. Um, in the initial 
conversations we have, patients who have delusions of infestation, it almost comes in a little different cognitively. It's as if the patient wants you to confirm their uh, belief, their fixed belief that they are infested. So mm -hmm. I am here not for you to tell me uh, what I have going on or how I can get it better. It's very often, I want you to declare with your medical and scientific knowledge that I am being infested with some sort of creature. Mm -hmm. And um, hand in hand with that is the person may say, I know I don't have scabies. I know I don't have lice because people have looked for this and I've been treated for those many times, but I still have this itchy sensation that's all over my body. And therefore I must be infested with some sort of organism, uh, mm -hmm. parasite, ectoparasite, nematode, insect. I must be infested with something that is uh, kind of outside the scope of normal conventional medication, medicine, the practice of medicine. So those are some of the features. The patient comes in already uh, with an established um, belief that they're infested. And um, oftentimes that goes hand in hand with the belief that their infestation is something that's unique, uh, peculiar, and perhaps outside the realm of conventional medicine. You know, um, yes, I mean, that's, I'm glad you outlined those, those points. Again, that idea of the patient already coming in, already diagnosing themselves. Also, I thought that something you said that was very important that I think is such a critical pearl. The patient may have already been treated multiple times before they reached a level of a specialist like yourself. Um, and the convention, the belief that it must be an infestation. Now, Dr. Norton, I can just tell just off of your approach because I always, regardless of whatever field we're in, the hallmark is the communication. The hallmark is the relationship that we establish with the patient. And I always think about, particularly with patients with delusions, their perception is their perception. So it's not as though they are trying to be necessarily difficult, but that is the perception and the belief that they have. Dr. Norton, how do you navigate that, the delicacy of that situation and working with a patient that, as you, I thought eloquently put it, is at, in many ways coming there for you to confirm what they in their mind already know, but you're trying to navigate this in a way where you keep the, the, the patient physician relationship and also guide them in a way in which you can get them the assistance and services that they need. Well, I think there's a couple of ways to approach this. Let me tell you how I uh, approach it when I'm evaluating a patient, but there's also the delicate management of the patient once we've established a diagnosis and begin the therapy. And I'm so glad that we have uh, Professor John Koo with us, who has really devoted many, many years to uh, this, this particular challenging problem. But um, one thing that uh, Dr. Koo and I uh, recognize right away is that these are not going to be short visits. Mm. When we do evaluate these patients, uh, they've often met with so many frustrations along the way that, that uh, we want them to feel like you've come to the right place. We're going, we're going to help you. So that means that I have to uh, dedicate time to the patient. Now, it may be a lot of time at one visit, or it may be uh, several visits over um, over several weeks. But um, I um, tell myself as I'm entering the room that um, remember, let's keep, uh, let's keep the patient's welfare at the foremost uh, in our mind. And uh, if something comes up that you might feel like uh, if you were a first year medical student, you would roll your eyes at, we <laughs> don't roll our eyes. Okay. Um, but uh, I certainly do a very thorough exam for all the various common types of infestations and for the uncommon ones. And mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps we can give you uh, some references later that might uh, outline how to do that sort of physical exam. Um, so I'm starting with the premise that the patient is correct. Perhaps there is an infestation, but um, if it, there are certain uh, features in the exam and in the patient's dialogue that make me think that this is something else, we, we must consider uh, so many other topics in the differential, other diseases, other existing skin diseases that can cause odd sensations, medications that can do this, other um, uh, psychiatric conditions as common as depression can certainly do this. The, 
you have uh, will uh, amplify any itch. Um, but one of the techniques that, that I do is I will bring in a double-headed microscope. Now, I realize that um, the psychiatrists don't have these in hand, but most dermatology clinics will have these. I'll bring in the microscope, and I'll put that in front of the patient. I'll say, give me two or three of your specimens that you believe are the most likely to show us the offending organism. And I'll put them on the, the microscope and we'll look at them together. And um, very often it's uh, quite evident that what we have there is just a bit of detritus or of um, uh, clothing, uh, textile threads. And I'll point that out to the, the patient. Um, and very often the patients, uh, many patients will say, I'm so glad you found this because now I can don't have to worry about me being infested or, or the likelihood that I might infest others. But um, you may find some patients who say, no, what you're looking, you're wrong, Dr. Norton, what you're looking at there is actually some sort of uh, fungal organism that is this and that, but um, where they believe that it's, it's confirmation. Uh, and then if we get into that situation, then I realize, well, let me continue my exam for other uh, more conventional, uh, I'll call them organic causes of pruritus. And if I don't get anywhere with that, we're going to have to start um, focusing on the likely diagnosis of delusions of parasitosis. So I can say that uh, uh, for a dermatologist, the examination is a um, conventional full body examination that you would do for a patient with an with a undiagnosed and uh, challenging condition. Well, Dr. Norton, I, I, you really walked us through some stuff that was so important. And the sitecast, we have different folks listening. And I think it's important if we have residents or medical students or trainees listening that we really break down a bit of what Dr. Norton just said, because it, it seems a bit like, you know, like, yeah, basic, but, but it's not. The first thing was time. This is a test. That's a test. A lot of clinicians and busy practices are not going to make the time or have the time to either have those extended visits or to have multiple frequent visits. Patients notice that. So I think the first thing I heard there was time. The next thing I heard, and thank you so much for saying that, Dr. Norton, 80% of what we communicate in life is nonverbal. Though our expressions, our eye shrugs, our this, our that. And when we heard Dr. Norton talk, what did he do? He centered himself before he enters the room. He's thinking about what needs to be done. That is, in my mind, showing respect to the patients as well as our what we're here to do as well as the process. The next thing, it, you, it's, it's amazing what a thorough, respectful exam will do when you go through the entire differential, when you go through the entire differential. And whether a patient has delusions or what have you or any of us, we're gonna respect the thoroughness of that clinician. And what I think about that, that establishes trust. All right, that establishes trust. And whether and whether the patient's in psychotherapy or any other place, the hallmark of a, a physician-patient relationship is trust. So at that point in time, we hope that we're establishing trust. And then the next thing, I mean, I don't, I, I'm, I, I mean, I, a double-headed microscope. That's so cool. All right, Dr. Norton pulls out a double-headed microscope, but this is the key thing. And I don't, I'm blanking on the person who said it. I don't know if it was. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, say, I don't know if it's Har Harvey Stack Sullivan. I'm not sure. But the idea was that they pulled the patient side by side and we're looking at life together. We are collaborative. We are working together. For me, I'm a CBT guy, so something I always say is collaborative empiricism. And notice in all those interventions, what Dr. Norton said was that, you know what? And sometimes patients are thankful, like, thank you. But I'm going to say the start of that intervention started at, before the patient even entered the room when the clinician centers himself and says, you know what, I'm going to go through this process to make sure that what I am diagnosing is accurate and I'm going to keep an open mind. So I thought that I just wanted to, you know, that, and I'm putting on my education hat a little bit here, but I just really so appreciated that description. Now, when we get to the point though, where we have started to make the diagnosis and we're considering delusional infestation or delusional parasitosis, now we have our colleague, Dr. Ku into the picture. All right. As, so, Dr. Ku, when you were working with or you were referred a patient, uh, whether it is from Dr. Norden or others, and you are having uh, you're focusing on delusional parasitosis or delusional infestation, what are some of the approaches that you have for intervening and working and getting our patients to a place of health? Well, uh, first of all, um, 
Dr. Norris, you're absolutely right. Uh, before you go into the room, it's already often decided if the outcome is going to be good or bad, depending on the provider's mindset. And there are many dermatologists uh, who are not used to talking to a delusional patient. In fact, who really don't like to deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. So they go in with unpleasant kind of, a, you know, already unhappy having to deal with this kind of patient. And that is not good. You know, so uh, even I am sometimes, um, especially if I'm behind already my patient uh, schedule, and then the next patient is a delusional patient, it, and I could easily mindlessly go into the room looking not happy. But, but I don't want uh, things to spiral downward. So sometimes I literally have to use my two hands and bring my face up Make sure I go in with a big smile. Mm -hmm. then pretend that I'm actually um, meeting my favorite Hollywood star. Yeah. And, and then, uh, and then when I when they talk about uh, these ideas, some of them sounds very bizarre, like a parasite with three eyes and twenty legs or whatever. Mm -hmm. I let them talk for a while um, to, to pay. Uh, uh, as much respect as I can, looking uh, bright eye, bushy tail, because uh, Dr. Norton uh, is absolutely right about, and you're absolutely right about, the most important thing is trust and rapport. So, so th that is my uh, you know, first priority. And uh, one thing I do not do is to, to give them instant invalidation. Mm. Nobody wants to be invalidated whether people are right or wrong. Mm. And, and, I, and I definitely don't want to get into any kind of antagonistic relationship. And sometimes these patients already had antagonistic relationship with prior dermatologists or other providers. So I have to actually get all, you know, uh, do better than that. And, but when we are stuck talking about ideology, you know, mm -hmm. is it parasite? Is it not parasite? Do you believe me? Th then it's going to be really difficult and we can't really go get anywhere therapeutically. Mm -hmm. So I purposely uh, show a whole lot of interest, but deep down inside, I, I want to slowly get the focus away from ideology which mm -hmm. and then into th treatment mm -hmm. because the medications that I use for this condition there's a Tourette's medication called Pimozide, brand name is ORAP. And then there are antipsychotics such as uh, Respedor, um, Aripiprazor, which is Abilify. Those medications actually work amazingly well with, mm -hmm. with very small dose. Mm -hmm. And because we only need very small dose, uh, even though we worry about side effects, uh, in my experience, side effects have been pretty rare. So the biggest problem is how do you get them to take it. And if, if they are uh, just focused on the ideology, um, I, I actually liked one of the terms that uh, Dr. Norton mentioned, Morgellons. The mm. Morgellons is a, a name that was given by some uh, lady in the US. Uh, but what's good about it is it doesn't have the stigma of uh, calling it delusion. Mm. It's sort of a neutral term. And, and it is possible for me to tell the patient that this is a condition that is uh, not common, but not rare. It happens all over the world. It's very puzzling. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows exactly what caused Morgellons, which is technically true. We have theories, but not absolute proof. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and also I tell them that it is almost um, overwhelmingly older women worldwide. Mm. It's very rare to see this in men or younger patients. I'm talking about um, uh, delusional suppressedosis or Morgellons where this uh, delusional idea comes spontaneously, not because somebody's addicted to cocaine or amphetamine or narcotic or somebody is demented, uh, has dementia or organic brain syndrome or schizophrenia. So, uh, so this is what we call primary delusion suppressedosis. 
And the cases that are primary, which means it happens spontaneously, once again, almost overwhelmingly older women worldwide. So, so that kind of make me make patients wonder, oh, why is it older women? And I like to know also. But most importantly, this patient has been through, just as Dr. Noto mentioned, many courses of anti-parasite medications, both mm. topically and orally. And then I tell the patient, strange thing about Mogellans, they never lead to a cure. Mm. When, when people have something living, tormenting them, whether it's bacteria or parasite like scabies, in medicine, that's one of the easier thing to cure as compared to like heart disease, which is, you know, much more difficult to deal with. And uh, sometimes I say, you know, the the organisms are either alive or dead, you know, so we don't understand why Morgellons, people don't get cured with all these different internal or external anti-parasite medications, whether it's antibiotic or or anti-scabies. But then I tell the patient, because I want to get away from the ideology, that I'm not a parasitologist, I'm not an entomologist. If, if you're really interested in pursuing ideology, I'm the wrong person. But the reason you would, re- the, the, what I can do for you is I can t- help you get rid of this problem because it's making your life into living hell. Mm-hmm. And, and then I actually articulate what the patients often experience, that this is really ruining their life, they cannot be with their uh, friends and relatives because they are afraid they might give them something. You know, it interfere with their sleep. It really make them into living hell, even though initially they all try to look brave and composed. But I, I deliberately articulate their misery and, and say, you know, you need to get out of this hell. Yeah. And, and I know how, you know, I have been successful in getting people out of this hell, even though I cannot tell you um, how, you know, how my medication worked because we don't know what really caused it. And then I said, I'm really interested in, find, in knowing what caused it too, but I'm afraid by the time you and I, by, by the time the mankind finds out what caused more gallons, we're going to be both dead of old age. Yep. But we have to get you out of this misery right now. You know, so that's how I get the patient to try the medication pragmatically like a trial and error. And the medicine that is historically most often used mm-hmm. is a medicine called Pimozide. Mm-hmm. Uh, the brand name is ORAP. And it's actually US FDA indicated only for Tourette syndrome. There is no psychiatric indication. So, and the reason this is very helpful is because many of these patients hate the idea that they are considered crazy. And mm-hmm. and, and uh, because some uh, practitioners have told them that and they really don't like it. So anything with inkling of mental health or psychiatry, unfortunately, these patients are very averse to. So it, uh, technically, medication like Respiradol or Aripiprazole or Abilify has less risk for tardive dyskinesia. But on the other hand, if, 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 if because they have psychiatric indication, which patient can easily look up nowadays on Google or Safari, mm-hmm. and as soon as they see that, then the report might be raptured. Mm-hmm. And it's very hard to fix that. You know, mm-hmm. So that I still tend to go for the first generation antipsychotic, uh, Pimozai, which some people can argue that, well, it doesn't have FDA indication for psychosis, so it's really anti Tourette's. Uh, mm-hmm. just because that's acceptable to the patient. And uh, just to go uh, very, uh, and, and, and in terms of dosage, you mm-hmm. know, I, I tell them that, you know, don't expect any quick fix. American medicine is very cautious, so we start with very low dose. Mm-hmm. So half a milligram, which is just half of one milligram tablet, and then I typically go up by half a milligram, no faster, not uh, the, every two to four weeks. And I tell them, don't expect any great improvement until we work up to three milligrams. Now, Pimozide is just like Haldo. It's only one methyl group apart. Mm -hmm. So the side effect profile is nearly identical. Mm -hmm. The the main concern is extra pyramidal pseudo-Parkinsonian side effect, stiffness, restlessness. So I have the patient carry over-the-counter Benadryl, 25 milligram, QID, PRN, stiffness or restlessness. But the dose that we typically need is so low 
that I cannot remember last time anybody had any side effect. <laughs> you know, the, typically, by the time they, they woke up to three milligram, which is very low dose by uh, any standard, including Tourette's, mm -hmm. the patients are dramatically often better. Uh, now, when I say better, what I mean by that is the crawling, biting, stinging sensation. Uh, dermatologists call the formication. Okay. Uh, it, uh, formica means ants in Latin. Mm -hmm. So formication greatly diminish. Their mental preoccupation greatly diminish. And, and then uh, with that, all these self-induced lesions tend to improve greatly. Mm -hmm. you know, so uh, the, the, once the patient notice improvement, and the typical two medication is Pimozide or Respidol, but mm -hmm. Respidol requires a uh, little more risk because Respidol does have psych indication in, order to, in terms of convincing the patient. But once they experience uh, improvement in terms of decreased chronic biting sensation, uh, and they can enjoy life again, that they mm -hmm. are... Uh, escape from the gripping grip of delusion, then then the whole idea about taking medication, the ambivalence disappear. In fact, oftentimes patients think these medications are God sent. Okay. You know, so I, then I tell them that that uh, will continue whatever the dose that uh, is good for them, which is usually three milligram per day or less of either pimozide or respirator, continue until all symptoms disappear. Now that takes uh, one, two, three months. And then when it's completely, all the symptoms are gone or almost gone, I'd ask the, the patient deliberately not to cold turkey or stop the medicine, but continue, this is what I do, the same medication for another two or three months, okay. which the patient totally don't mind because by that time, most patients really like this medicine. And if they have no sign of recurrence or no symptom at all, for extra maybe three months or so, then I don't call Turkey, I go down very slowly, uh, the same way I came up, uh, decrease not more than half a tablet of one milligram or 0 0.5 milligram, every t uh, not sooner than every two to four weeks. And then, so it's almost look like a trapezoid. You go up on the dose, find a good dose, mm -hmm. stay on that, that good dose until everything disappear, continue the same dose for another three months or longer, and then go down on the trapezoid and all, when, when we do it this way, um, I, I don't mean to, uh, I hope, inflate uh, what I'm saying, but most people are cured. In okay. my 35 years of doing this, uh, when I see new patients almost every week or every other week, I had only five people who had one recurrence, which was promptly taken care of by repeating this trapezoid-like dosage wow. strategy usually with Pimozide, but also with Respirador. And then I had only one patient who had recur two recurrences. And that lady who had two recurrences, by the time she came back with second recurrence, she was already convinced that there's no parasite involved, even though she was a true believer the first mm -hmm. time I saw her. And then I used the same Sharpizoi approach, and, and she has not had a fourth recurrence. So... It appears that this condition is very responsive. Uh, the, the patients are not, all, uh, you know, I, I already mentioned are mostly older women for spontaneous primary cases that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But they're also well-established, um, well-to-do women. Um, then, then they, of course, rarely there's some men also. As opposed to uh, secondary cases, secondary to like drug abuse or organic brain syndrome, it, uh, those secondary cases can be more of a marginal type of uh, people in the society, drug, you know, drug users and so forth. But the primary cases are mostly the, the people with no psychiatric uh, problem whatsoever before that was significant, people who are well adjusted. So once they're treated, their prognosis is really good. But at least that's been my experience. Well, Dr. Ku, thank you for actually really walking us through in a very detailed and nuanced fashion, um, not only how you address and work with the patients, and I won't say it, I like your term, you're in hell and we have to get you out of hell. I, I feel like in my mind, no, that's a great, because we're not actually 
challenging the etiology. You know, we're that in other words, we're not getting into that fixed false belief. We're like, no, you're in hell. We're not worried about how you're in hell, but we have to get you out. Um, and you answered so many of my questions. Um, one, what, what can we use? Um, you also answered one of my concerns in regards to akathisia. You know, I always wonder how these patients would feel. And then you also spoke about, if you will, the treatment course. Uh, I'm going to ask you and Dr. Norton a, a, a couple of questions, but right, I want to ask you, uh, actually, yeah, I'll start with you, Dr. Koo, just in terms of the, what you described, because you you talked about the, the, the typical or atypical patient profile, older woman, um, certain perhaps, say, socioeconomic status. Um, when, and I, I opened this up to both you and Dr. Norton, when you work with the patients after you have treated and let's say, you know, we are in the, um, we are now in the maintenance phase of treatment, like, you know, the bottom half of that trapezoid and they're feeling better. When you, when you all look back, do you find certain precipitants or any trends or precipitants that preceded um, the, uh, the, the, if you will, the appearance of the delusional parasitosis? Dr. Koo, you first, sir. Um, yes, uh, stress seems to be one common trigger, although not present in everybody, but, but kind of notably in many people when they are extra stressed, they, some people develop this whole problem. That's the, the other thing is uh, some of these delusional cases follow real infestation, okay. in a, a good, which is very similar in a phenomena to people who uh, end up with uh, diagnosed with like hookworm, tapeworm, intestinal parasite. It's 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 well known that some of those people later on develop psychosis about having parasite in their intestine. I have heard of the you know the the, the internal parasite uh, post internal parasite psychosis. It's it does uh, some of these uh, rarely the patient might have post scabies psychosis. And Dr. Koo, I think you, 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 you gave us a really nice transition point to Dr. Norton. Um, and Dr. Norton, how often, again, with that, that, that question in terms of the precipitating fat or things that preceded it, do you actually see patients post some other form of infestation and now having delusional parasitosis? It does happen. Um, to me, that's a, a smaller uh, proportion of my patients. I, I find that as far as uh, precipitating the, uh, the event, this uh, monosymptomatic psychosis, uh, very often it's precipitated by travel. A person has mm. gone abroad somewhere, and um, when they've returned, they have this, or they actually develop this and attribute it to travel abroad that perhaps they took place a year or two earlier, where the time sequence really isn't necessarily logical for cause and effect, but they think, if I'm infested with some sort of organism, hmm, it might have been on that vacation to the Caribbean that I took three years ago, and the organism is finally coming out. So I find that one a lot. Um, I have had a number of men who've had this, who had um, sexual affairs um, outside their marriage, uh, oh. and, and they seem, when they come back, it probably uh, in a uh, almost a Freudian sense, like a, a guilt yeah. complex, and they're worried that they've acquired some sexually transmitted disease or some sort of infestation. Um, and uh, a number of patients will look to either their own pets or pets of other family members and wonder if they've acquired something from the pets. And that can be difficult because uh, one of the entomologists that uh, Dr. Kuhn and I have worked with has reported to us that she's aware of many pets, household pets, dogs and cats, that have actually been taken to a veterinarian to be uh, euthanized because the, um, the owner believes that their pet is the source of this recurrent oh infestation. And, and as Dr. Ku said, one of the uh, striking features is that some of these interventions, having your pet euthanized or taking this medication, those do not relieve the um, delusions of infestation. Uh, that you may wind up getting almost a placebo effect for a week or two where the individual says, oh, I, I felt so much better within minutes of of taking this medication or of this act within minutes, uh, I felt so much better, but you know, it came back 
shortly thereafter. Just a, another anecdote uh, to go along with um, Dr. Ku's uh, report of, of, of success with pimazide, which I also have found mm -hmm. very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I found some patients will tell me that the pimazide is very helpful. It seems to reduce their parasite load. It's, <laughs> it's as if they believe it's an anti-parasitic medication, even though I might have explained that it's a Tourette's medication, but they say it has this amazing ability to cut down their parasite load. If they take the medicine faithfully, it gets rid of the parasites completely, but when they uh, take it um, intermittently, the parasites seem to start to come back. I don't know if Dr. Ku has uh, observed that sort of phenomenon as well. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, some people, uh, because they're delighted with how well the pimozide work, that they actually believe that the pimozide is killing the parasites or whatever the, the organism. And I, I totally do not contradict them. Yeah. I don't endorse it and I don't contradict. You know, I, I, I say that, uh, you know, I'm a pragmatist and yeah. that's the basis with which I'm uh, trying to help you. You know, it, it is, so whatever you think is the, the way that this medicine is helping you is fine with me because I don't want to risk report by uh, contradicting the, 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 the patient. Now, uh, I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time on it, but there is a very interesting theory uh, in Europe on how Pimozide and Respidol and other medication work and why most of these uh, delusions of parastosis patients are more women than men, older than younger, Hmm. And what you know in the spontaneous cases, which is what we're talking about, and um, th then the theory goes like this: We all know that if we end up with too much dopamine in the uh, intrasynaptic space, people can start to hallucinate and have delusion. In women, not so much men. There are um, there's a system which is often referred to as DAT system which stands for dopamine transport system. And that is very active in women to regulate the amount of dopamine in the intrasynaptic place. But whereas men does not have as much dependence on this system. Unfortunately, DAT system is very much dependent on estrogen level. So as the women get older, estrogen level goes down and some of the women end up with too much dopamine end up having uh, the whole hallucination, delusion, the delusion of parastosis phenomena, which is thought to be, in, the, the, in Europe, opposite phenomena from Parkinson's disease. Men is much more likely to get Parkinson's disease as opposed to women much more likely to get delusions of parastosis. And because Parkinson's disease is not enough dopamine, Delusions of parasitosis seems to be too much dopamine. So if you treat delusions of parasitosis with medication like Pimozide or Respidol, some of those people develop Parkinsonian symptom. Meanwhile, men with Parkinson's syndrome, if when they are treated with anti-Parkinson medication, which increase dopamine, some of them develop delusions of parasitosis. You know, so that is an interesting theory, which I will not share with the patient unless the patient is willing to hear it. Um, yeah, you know, that, yeah, that's very interesting. And I, mean, I just want to touch on that just real quickly. I'm curious, and maybe you and Dr. Norton can also comment. Do the patients that you, that you all typically see or treat, do they have a family history of some uh, either maybe a schizophrenia spectrum disorder or a delusional disorder that comes out later? I'm just I'm just curious, I, as, uh, as you were describing it, Dr. Ku, and the decrease in the estrogen and things of that nature, I'm trying to think of maybe a second or a third factor that might be involved that can make certain patients more vulnerable than others, just thinking out loud there. So... Um uh, Dr. Norris, one of the things I've always found so fascinating about the patients with primary uh, delusions of infestation mm -hmm. is that they are so normal outside. Yeah, they're of, so normal. That's right. Outside of that one uh, mm -hmm. characteristic trait. So yeah. when you talk to these individuals, you find, uh, say for physicians, they're, they're my peers. There are people who are attorneys, bankers. I've had people yes. who are researchers at NIH, people who work at uh, Capitol Hill, uh, both as federal employees and as lobbyists. Um, 
And uh, if you were simply to uh, encounter them on when you're on a walk in the park and you start to chat with them, you'd be delighted to uh, chat with a, a highly functioning individual. But then when this topic comes up, it really uh, goes off the rails there. And uh, so what I found is, although, um, so the, many of these individuals seem to have uh, very uh, normal, unremarkable personal uh, mental health lives and their families are that way. However, once the uh, delusions become uh, dominant in that person's life, not only does it cause that individual's personal life, marriage, friendships, family relations, occupation to start to spiral downhill, but it does almost for everybody else within that household. Um, we wind up with family members who are almost trapped. Either they believe completely and they wind up getting caught in this uh, mm. delusional uh, feature as well, a folie à deux or folie à famille, um, or they they are skeptical and that can create the tension and antagonisms inside the home also. So the mental health uh, of that person's uh, uh, environment uh, certainly is going to spiral downhill once uh, the delusions of infestation becomes a dominant feature of that person's life. You know, I totally agree with uh, what Dr. Norton just mentioned. What's remarkable about these people are in the main, they are amazingly normal, not just themselves, but their family member as compared to the usual kind of mental uh, illness patients that are, you know, uh, such as people with uh, bipolar, depression, uh, major depressive episodes, schizophrenia, substance abuse, that, that these people are high functioning uh, oftentimes and because of what Dr. Norton described, in Europe, uh, there is a term that is used. Uh, one is monosymptomatic hypochondriacal psychosis, mm -hmm. or MHP. You know, because unlike schizophrenia, where patients have all kinds of deficit, uh, they hear voices, they have flat affect, they have crazy ideas. These people are like so normal until they talk about parasites. You know, it's also referred to as, as encapsulated delusional system. It's a delusional system that is like in a capsule where everything else is fine except this thing. So that is a very unique feature of this condition that they are so normal and their family is typically so normal. But once they start this process, they really become a human wreck. Yeah, this is very interesting to me. I mean, uh, again, I am not a... Um, schizophrenia is not my field or schizophrenia spectrum disorders or delusional disorders. But hearing this great conversation from you all, it does make me think about, I have to kind of read up myself again in regards to the relationship between delusions, uh, delusional disorders, delusional parasitosis, and schizophrenia spectrum disorders, whether it's schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. Um, but now I want, in, in you, excellent and superb points, but, but as we're, as we're kind of winding down here, I do want to actually ask both of you, um, how did you become interested in this, uh, this, this disease as well as this patient population? Because as you both articulated, I mean, you know, this takes a little, this takes a certain amount of time and effort and not everybody can do this without being frustrated. And to me, it's very clear that both of you are interested, passionate, and care about your patients. And I'm just curious if you would share with the audience what led you to become interested in working in this area. Dr. Norton, please, sir. Well, I mentioned that I have a background in um, tropical medicine, entomology, and parasitology. Um, I was a field biologist before going into medicine. Oh. So the relationship between or re relationships among organisms is what interests me most of all. Um, and uh, over the years, because of this interest, I would uh, have many patients referred to me who had some unexplained um, uh, suspicion or concern that they have an unusual parasite. And I suppose um, out of curiosity, I wanted to find out, well, do they or not? And, um, and again, although the patients take a lot of time 
to um, to properly uh, manage, to evaluate them and, and begin the treatment, it is kind of a fascinating glimpse into the human mind um, mm. to see someone who has, who's a high functioning individual with this fixed belief. So um, I, I found it very interesting. I, in my academic practice, I, I tell my residents, I think that every resident or every practicing dermatologist should have at least one of these patients on their uh, on their roster so that they can um, work with them and it helps uh, the physician uh, recognize or, or work with people who have challenging psychological conditions, almost like what you were saying at first, it really uh, makes you perhaps a better physician to, to think about the, all the dimensions that are involved in this. So um, that, um, is how I got involved with that, but I became, maintained an interest in it for the, exactly the reason that Dr. Ku mentioned. Most dermatologists, and infectious disease docs, do not want to see these patients because they take so much time and the, and the relationships often wind up being a little bit uh, antagonistic. Uh, I've always felt that my job in academic medicine was to see patients with challenging conditions, whether it's challenging medically, socially, psychologically, and that's where uh, in every community someone has to be around to see these patients, and I will step forward and, and, and take care of them in my community. Dr. Ku, sir. Um, to, to my uh, s study, my interest is pretty obvious that I'm double boarded in psychiatry and dermatology. But I also to find that the very topic very fascinating, you know, uh, about this interface between skin and mind, mm -hmm. especially, uh, the, you know, the delusion uh, is something that uh, really encompasses a whole lot of human experience, uh, meaning that um, when I learned how to connect and talk to delusional patients, it actually helped me uh, to better understand and talk to my teenage kids. <laughs> it helped me <laughs> to understand people who have the different political idea in uh, this very polarized America. In, in, in a, uh, the, the whole um, skill set that you need in order to, to connect with somebody whose thinking is so different than yours. And even though deep down inside, scientifically, I know I'm right, but if that's all I think about, then there's only going to be fight between me and this patient, just like it's only going to be fight between me and my teenage kids. And I don't have any teenage kids. They're too much older now. But, you know, so, so the whole topic of how do people become not only fixated and ego invested in certain idea, but how do you get around that in, in human relationship? You know, that is also fascinating. But the last thing, the last motivation is similar to what uh, Dr. Norton mentioned. In my opinion, the biggest unmet need in dermatology, maybe even the whole of medicine, is these people with delusions of parastosis, more gallons. Uh, because the, the, the people who are best trained to connect with these people with empathy are psychiatrists. And yet these patients don't want to go see a psychiatrist. And the rest of the medicine, including dermatology, are really not uh, in, the, 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 trained to, to talk to delusional patient in a constructive way. So they, they do their best, but oftentimes it end up in an antagonistic, very unpleasant kind of relationship. And on top of that, many dermatologists don't want to deal with these patients in the first place because they take up time um, uh, financially, they're kind of, you know, lost opportunity because there are a whole lot of procedure where you can make a lot more money, a lot quicker. And now I don't want to make dermatology sound like a materialist kind of specialty, but, uh, and then on top of that, they're not used to, to dealing with people with invisible problem. Dermatology as a specialty is very visually oriented, very proud of our subjective, uh, scientifically obje objective basis. You know, so so uh, the, the, to think that you have to deal with something invisible, like emotion, subjective, and not only that, 
let the subjective reality within reason drive the interaction. In other words, we are used to having patients respect us. The, the patients revolved around us as dermatologists. The, 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 but oftentimes when you successfully connect to these people, you, we have to revolve around the patient within reason. And, and that change of mindset is really difficult for many dermatologists and many non-psychiatric physicians, maybe even difficult for some mental health professionals. You know, so, so, uh, the, so the whole uh, the field has so much unmet need, so many frustrated patients, even some people who are knowledgeable about this disease because they're interested in subject matter don't, don't necessarily want to see these patients because they don't want the negative impact financially and otherwise of, of the, on their practice. You know, so, so the, the number of people who are really passionate about seeing these patients US-wide may be less than the numbers of fingers in two hands. You know, and and that's, that's where I feel like, uh, just like Dr. Norton, somebody has to step out and try to uh, address this problem. Dr. Ku, Dr. Norton. I want to thank you for your words. Um, I'm struck by everything that both of you just said. Uh, uh, what Dr. Ku, you said uh, about, uh, and it's, tr- it's really true that our patients in many ways make us better fathers, sons, husbands, what have you, uh, wives. Uh, what uh, Dr. Norton said, I, I resonated with that, that um, in many ways, this, this, when we're working with those that, um, they present a challenge that are hard, that are difficult. This really speaks to why we are in medicine uh, to begin with. So I want to thank both of you. Uh, and I feel very, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that I actually have a chance to speak with like two of the fingers. And I really hope that uh, as our audience here um, is listening, I hope they've appreciated this um, one perspective or glimpse of this uh, as it was so beautifully worded.